gonna shake your booties for black girl nerds. Billy, it is such a pleasure to talk to you. Hi, I've, I've been so intrigued by this character because he's managed to navigate in a way unlike everyone else. Everyone had their crash and burn in season one, but not you. What do you think in that season he knew more so than anyone else that's preparing him to go into this next phase of, of life at the network? Well, I, I would, I'm not sure geography knew it, but I think he had uh, a confidence that regardless of how his career went in the television news industry, that he would be able to recover and pick up the pieces and move on somewhere else. So he has this sort of secret power, which is he's unflappable in his confidence that he can navigate whatever situation comes before him. So he can put his ambition on full display. So what ends up happening on this uh, in this season is he has something at stake now because he has accomplished something in this and cares about some of the people who are involved. And I think there's a different kind of responsibility that comes with that that maybe he wasn't totally prepared for. So he doesn't want uh, to fail anymore because he cares. And that uh, we'll, we'll see the way in which that uh, percolates over time. When you have a person like that with that level of confidence and just kind of that awareness of the lay of the land, what's the worst thing that could happen to him to kind of shake that confidence? Because no one has the key to it yet. Yeah, it's a great day. point. Well, no, I, I, I suspected something, um, one of those um, landmarks of life uh, kind of things that uh, is, is going to, there's going to have to be a death in the family. He's going to have to have a child or fall in love, or um, he's going to have to encounter some sort of uh, health problem. Any, anything mm -hmm. that would uh, destabilize the story that he tells himself about himself every day. Those are the kinds of things that you really need apocalyptic things to interfere with that kind of ego. Mm -hmm. As most, most, well, some people are, are just chatty people by nature, but with Corey in particular, there is a lot of dialogue, a lot of memorization, because he's talking constantly to everyone. Yes. He's a businessman, he's a salesperson, he's a little snaky at times. You know, what, what's the key for you just that amount of dialogue? Because it is a lot, even for as skillful as a performer as you. I, I got tired as soon as you started talking about it, because I, I'm telling you, I saw some of those scripts and I thought, all right, oh, you better go to the gym. Get, uh, it's because it's really about stamina. That's all, that's all it is, making sure that obviously you have to be well prepared and understand what the writer is trying to accomplish with that story. They, they, they have a purpose beyond seeing their uh, seeing an, an, an interesting monologue. They, ha they have a vested interest in writing for somebody who speaks in a monologue. So mm -hmm. you wanna be able to uh, honor that, uh, that desire of theirs. And uh, with Corey, it is, it truly all about uh, stamina. So making sure that I do simple things to keep myself and my energy and my focus uh, where, where it needs to be to uh, exploit those opportunities is a big feature of how I get through the day on the morning show. Well, you do it expertly. I thank you, sir, for your time. Fabulous show. Thank Super you so much. I really appreciate season. that. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana, for your time. I appreciate you greatly and what you brought to the morning show. Fascinating, fascinating character. Oh, thank you. When, when we meet her, there's a sort of Dante's Inferno going on at the station. And we're introduced to this, this intelligent, really gifted woman who seems largely underutilized compared to the rest of the, the staff of the station. What can you tell us about about uh, Laura's journey throughout the season and uh, what she brings to this mix of people and all they're undergoing amidst the investigation and yeah, well, I, I um, so Laura is someone who who is sort of the star of the nightly news at the network, and she's brought in for all the big interviews, and her and Corey go way back, and he asks her when you first meet her, 
he has asked her to interview Bradley and Alex separately to make this big to-do of them coming back to the morning show together as co-hosts. And so what I, what I think is the most prevalent thing about Laura's character is the fact that she is 100% comfortable in her own skin. She has no skeletons in her closet. She has no agenda because she's completely safe in her job. She has proven herself over and over again to be at that place in her job. And she's also very, um, I would say, uh, successful in her personal life in that she has completely um, understood who she is to herself. So she doesn't care what other people think. But when you see these two lead women through her eyes, you realize that's all they care about. What do people think of me? What are they going to find out about me? What do I need to keep hiding? It's exhausting. You can see her see how exhausting it is because she too, years ago, hid who she was. And there was always that threat that someone might out her. And it happened and she lost her job because of it. But then she had to go through the fire to get back to who she really was. And so watching her watch these people slowly unravel, it's almost like she's the calm eye of the storm, right? Because they're all sort of swirling around her. Um, it's a very powerful position to be in when you have no skin in the game because you don't need it. Not to mention a heightened awareness of self that none of these people really truly have a grasp on compared to to Laura and where she's at in the journey. Would you would you say she's like a, a truth sayer? Absolutely. Because with no skin, she has no reason not to be. Right. That's that's what she does as in her profession is to uncover the truth. And it's what she does in her personal life. She's like, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. I don't need you. If you don't like it, go. <laughs> this I this was a very meaningful show. And I this these interviews were very, very personal to me and my experiences in the workplace. And I could see a lot of relatability to it. When you look back over the course of what you've accomplished with this season, what are you most proud of? I think, um, well, oh gosh, that's a great question. What am I most proud of would be, I, I think the fact that I was able to come into a well-oiled machine and truly just, I felt like Laura seamlessly blended in to a show that was already well-established because the writing was so good. You know, it is very rare for an actor to be able to walk into a show already with the writing because she had given me this 20 year history of this character. I felt very comfortable being there because I knew who this character was. Um, and also, you know, I, people keep asking me if I was nervous to go and work with all these, you know, big hitters. And the truth is I was excited. You're only as good as the person opposite you. And so when they're that good, I know it's going to up my game. And that was exciting. My first scene, I remember I was a little nervous for my first scene just because I hadn't memorized lines in a while. And, you know, your brain is a muscle and it takes a while to get there. And I used to be so good at it because I did it every day for seven years. Um, and my first scene was with Billy, who I've known for years. You know, we've never gotten to work together. I've been a huge fan of his. And it was just the best way to describe it is when you bake with room temperature butter instead of butter right out of the fridge. When you bake with room temperature butter, everything blends in so beautifully and the cookies come out perfectly. When the butter's cold, it's not going to work. And so it was, it, I know it's a corny um, way to put it, but that's how it felt. It felt like everything was mixing beautifully. And so I think for me, just as a, as an actor who loves what I do, to be able to do that kind of level of acting with people I admire, I don't think it gets better than that. Madame, you were brilliant. I truly enjoyed you this oh, thank season. You. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you speaking with me. Likewise, thank you so much. Thank you, Hassan, for your time. Hi. And for and bringing some new flavor into season two, season uh -huh. two. When Great. we when we when we meet Eric, he's kind of thrust into this crazy vortex of things that are happening 
at the network. If you were stepping into a job for the first day, or not the first day, you were stepping into this setting and there's all this stuff going on, what do you think he is feeling since we're learning about him as we go along and we don't know a whole lot of his backstory? before we fully are introduced. Yeah, when we open up season two of The Morning Show, you meet Eric, my character. You know, he's this young, charismatic TV host that's come to co-anchor The Morning Show with Bradley Jackson. And we open with a big song and dance number. If I was joining any new news organization, I think opening with a song and dance number is great. I got to get my Indian James Corden on, you know, and, and I got to do a big, like, musical performance with, with Reese. And over the course of the season, we start to see hey, Eric has come in, he wants to leave a mark on the show and he wants to climb the ranks. And everybody at the show, you know, doesn't really like that. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about him is we've watched all these people crash and burn to a certain extent over the course of season one. And now in season two, it's sort of the aftermath. It's sort of what's current. When you, before you are brought in season two, when you look at season one, what struck you about that season that you that was helpful for you to prepare for season two. Yeah, one of the things I love most about the show is it focuses on the central themes of these very zeitgeisty topics, cancel culture, power dynamics in the workplace, gender dynamics in the workplace, the racial and social reckoning that is currently happening in America right now. But it navigates the gray zone of all of that. And one of the things that Carrie and Mimi do brilliantly in the show is every character on the show thinks they're the hero of their own narrative. When in reality, we come to find out, hey, there's flaws in all of these characters. And, and that's what I really wanted to bring in. You know, when I was coming to the sh show and each scene, I was thinking to myself, hey, Eric thinks that he deserves everything that he's getting. He deserves to be respected. He deserves to climb the ranks. He deserves to get that promotion that he really wants. Um, carry that energy into it. Carry that energy and see how they play back to you and that that was really fun to be in these really dramatic scenes with jennifer aniston and reese witherspoon so well, i'm intrigued so you, your character kicks off with this big dance number with reese as folks will get to see great job by the way oh thank you give How it a, can, you, can you give it a, a ranking on um, one to ten i'm gonna give you no i'm not gonna rank it because okay. i don't want people to ruin it i don't want to ruin it for anyone okay I'll, okay okay i'll give you about an eight so wow. Okay. How did they explain it to you? I mean, with roles and dialogue, or it's your character, et cetera, you build it. But the first thing jumping off is you're singing and dancing with Reese Witherspoon. How did they explain it to you as the jumping off point? You know, Mimi basically broke down, look, the way we end season one is obviously there is a huge implosion at UBA. UBA has to have a brand new look. Mia Jordan is now the producer, you know, uh, played by Karen Pittman, who's incredible, by the way. Um, and now there's a new co-host. And, and what, is, what is the tenor and temperature of, of that new host? What could be the biggest juxtaposition of a meltdown happening on live television, a song and dance number? And, and I love how Mimi and everybody on set, we just fully leaned into it for episode 201. And, and I think the audience gets to see that. So you, can, you really feel like, okay, the morning show is trying to be uh, this new revamped remixed thing. And we come to find out, hey, maybe th some things haven't changed. Maybe some things are worse than, than season one. I like how you said that, a song and dance, very apropos for what these people are doing in the workplace. I thank totally. you for, for your time, Hassan. You're incredible. And this is a great, great show. Thank you for your time. No, thanks for talking to me. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Madam, you look very beautiful. Thank you for your time. So do you, sis. How are you today? I'm very good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad to be talking to you. Very much likewise. I thought a lot about Mia and my own personal experiences in corporate spaces, being Black in corporate spaces. And I thought about her navigating this, this environment that wants these perception of authentic relationships, but there really is no room for any authenticity when the cameras aren't rolling. Is Mia going to have an opportunity to to feel, to be, to exist without this dark cloud hanging over her that other people have placed there? Yeah, I think that's such a great question. And what I love about this show and what the writers and producers provide uh, the audience with is that 
you all see what Mia goes through, right? But when she's at work, no one else sees it. And it gives you a certain level of um, intimacy into who she is. And um, I think that's part of why people want uh, more uh, information on her and what's going on. It's because we reveal so much to the audience without revealing it to uh, those characters, colleagues. It's a, it's a beautiful, interesting, wonderful place to sit in. Um, Will you see more of that? Definitely. Will you know more about Mia? I'm not quite sure in season two, if you will, but you will continue to have the desire to to want to know what is going on with her. She is so interesting uh, because that's how she's written. Over the, the course of season two in the episodes that I saw Mia and Daniel, we get to see more exchanges between the two of them, opening a further dynamic of being the only black folks in a predominantly white space. How are those relationships helping or hindering them in the work, their relationship with each other? Right, I, I, you know, what we did explore, and I talked with Carrie Aaron and the writers about this, is this very nuanced conversation that we are used to in the African-American community, um, that not all skin folk are kin folk, right? We look at race very different ways, as differently as, as uh, we are individually, our fingerprint on the world is as different as as racism affects us individually. And I think that what you'll find in the relationship between Mia and Daniel as we explore it over season two is that both of them have very different responses and reactions to how they deal with race in in uh, UBA and, and on the morning show. Lastly, when you look at all of the characters, if you weren't a character on the show and you're just an audience member like me, who do you think among the team is the most quote unquote normal, I guess you could say. They all have their trials, but some seem to be doing better than, than others. It's such a great question. Um, I feel like the, the characters on the morning show are written to be misfits a little bit. You know, there's a great deal of dysfunction and, um, you know, difficulty in working in an environment like that. Um, I did some research at a morning television news show and it is, <laughs> you know, it is such an interesting space to see uh, folks walking around in the morning providing news, you know, sunny and exciting and happy. And um, it really is a hard work, but it's also interesting to get to know who those journalists are behind all of that news that they're giving. And so, um, I think the morning show is built so that each character has a bit of uh, conflict in them and, and you get the chance to experience that. Uh, no one is normal, I don't think. I agree. I appreciate your time. I can't look at daytime TV the same now. <laughs> this one That's great. Party. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me. I appreciate it. Deshaun, thank you so much for your time. You give hey. me, you give me so much life. You give me so much life every time I see you on the screen, and oh, uh, just I feel like you're just being a black person in a corporate environment. Oh, please, yes, yes, one hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> you are wonderful, and I was looking, I was looking at your social, and it said that you were a theater nerd, and it got me thinking about Daniel and how he's not allowed to feel, he's not allowed to emote or express or anything. Will he have an opportunity to feel anything without others trying to squash those things down within him this season? Um, yeah, you know, I, you know, Daniel's journey, I relate to it so much because it's such a, um, you know, well, the way that he's so vocal about his experience, um, you know, and really working within a white space, right? The 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 level of um, just uh, uh, tension that he feels, and you know, this season he starts to be more vocal about it. I think his, I think what's happening is that Daniel starts to mirror what I feel is happening in the country in terms of how we talk about. Uh, systemic racism, right? I, I've just as for myself, I've had to go back and get re-educated on certain things uh, over this past year and a half. And so the language with how, which, with how we're calling out systemic racism and how we're expressing our um, uh, our own experiences 
and really trying to figure out a way to express your experience without centering whiteness. And so all those types of uh, evolution that is happening in the, nat in the national dialogue is starting to happen within Daniel. And so I was very excited for it as it started to unfold because I, I feel like, you know, I want to see more shows talking about this experience and more characters like Daniel who are, um, you know, calling it out. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talk about art imitating life with that, with that calling out, you know, it's very close to you. As you said, you mentioned you could relate to a lot of things. So how does that change the preparation for a role? Obviously, you're not this person, but you do have shared experiences. There are a lot of them. So does that change your approach to the material? It does change my approach to the material because, um, you know, I feel even more uh, responsibility and honor and you know this whole year and a half working on a, a a show during covid when you know one of the things i've 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 been vocal about that throughout this covid experience there was a couple days when i just was not okay i mean we're talking about george floyd we're talking about Maude Aubrey, we're talking about looking at black and brown folks you know constantly um you know uh being more and more uh, expressed in the media as, you know, as a black man, just, um, you know, the way that it feels sometimes as if you're being targeted. <laughs> and so there were some days when it was just like, ah, I just, you know, it's difficult to be in the skin right now. And so the opportunity for me with it was, it was, I was grateful to have a platform where we're starting to have conversations like this. And so it just made it more personal and more important. And yeah, so those were the nuances in which it colored and shaded the experience. It was beautiful. It's like targeted in the streets, overlooked at work. So it was a crazy mm -hmm. juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deshaun, for your time. You are oh, incredible. You. And I just loved it. Thank you so uh, much. Uh, thank you so much. You have a good day. You too. Take care. Thank you so much for your time, Mark. I appreciate it. I have been in a rabbit hole of this show for the past three days, and I just, I really love it. And oh, thank you. I got to thinking about Chip and the environment that he's forced to work in. He seems at the core to be a sweet person who's in this environment that doesn't celebrate that sweetness, that caring. What is the biggest difference that you can speak of, of what happens to him in season one? versus what happens in season two? Will he be allowed to feel in season two? Such an excellent and thoughtful question. Thank you. Um, I, I think what's happening in season one is there's an explosion uh, of, a, of a moment and a movement. And it's all about triage, trying to stop the bleeding. Um, and so you can't almost even think about uh, delicate and nuanced interpersonal dynamics. You just have to try to keep the thing from dying and season two is more about the subtleties and how do you put it back together and and who are you going to be and how do you move forward and i think as that applies to chip you know one of the most important relationships in his life is that with alex levy and it's certainly fraught with peril it's toxic it's codependent but there is a lot of love and a lot of history there and so uh i agree with you that chip has a sweetness and a love to him. It's something I've tried to bring to that character and, and infuse into him. But at the same time, you know, I think that he's struggling with some of the complicity he has had in the past about he knew some of these wrongdoings were going on and he didn't do anything about it. So he's having a crisis of conscience as well. And he's trying to figure out what does it mean to be a white man and an ally in this age, um, he no longer has the power he used to have. And it's very confusing to him. And it's just so fun to, to play that. It is. I just, the depth of all of the different characters is incredible. And it's, you know, it, it takes you back to working in a corporate environment. Mm. All of them are supposed to be, especially the producers, are supposed to be highly socialized people with terrific people skills because they need to go get, chase a story, chase the talent but they are outside of that environment are really not very social people because they can't can can those two things coexist can they be social people outside of the office in an environment that wants it but doesn't celebrate it that's such a good question again i think that you know there's this there's this lore about therapists that they're so great about giving advice but then they're awful in their own relationships you know um and i think that that something like that could be applied to what's happening to 
you know, the producers, the talent in the morning show. I don't know what the answer is. Is it that they spend all of their quote unquote good energy, you know, at work or on camera, and then they save nothing left for their personal lives so that those are just left in ruin. Um, maybe that's part of it. Um, I also think that there are tremendous egos involved um, with people who get into this business. You know, they're very smart. They try to say, I'm doing this for the good of the world. I'm doing this because it's important, but let's face it big egos here um and, and i just love exploring those those nuances and i think one of the fun things about the morning show is that um i don't know that these people are ever going to fully emotionally evolve and figure themselves out which means that's just endless conflict for us to be able to play around with for sure for sure and lastly if you looked around at the different cast people as an outside say you weren't on the show who do you mm -hmm. think of the of the of the perform is the most secure person in the workplace mm. of all of the people who work there who has it the most together well i'm continually impressed with karen Pittman, who plays mia in the show and i've really loved watching her on and off camera and how she handles herself um she was brought in as a you know sort of a secondary character in season one um you could see how talented she was. You can see how well she handles herself on set and how everyone loves her. You can see her role increase in season two. Um, it, she's really a model of how to do it right, um, not, both creatively and what she gives as an actor, but also who she is as a person on set. I love that. And I love Chip. I feel for him deeply. Thank you so much oh, for thanks. your time. I appreciate it. And thanks for the thoughtful questions. No problem. Sure, Giandra LaBeouf, Black Girl Nerds. Good morning, sir. How are you? Thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Giandra. I love the title of your of your show, of your outlet. That's awesome. Thank you very, very much. I got to thinking about Yanko a lot and how he relates to the other people in the mix. And he seems to have a different level of death and emotional, like pure, genuine, emotional com you know, complex complexity to him compared to everyone else. Why do you think he is allowed to feel that even in the work environment compared well, to everyone else? Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I think that's just the way he's wired. I think this is a guy who, you know, and I, this is what I love about the writing of the show is that every, you know, every character is so specific, but I think he's wired in a way that he feels completely underappreciated because he really has invested in his career as a meteorologist purely out of passion. It's not because of necessarily you know, fame per se, although I'm sure obviously he's embraced that, you know, he could be, he do, he could be doing this off camera, um, you know, uh, but, but I think he's truly passionate about it. And I think that's why he feels misunderstood, underappreciated at every turn. He feels like, you know, he wants to inject his poetry in every one of his, you know, weather casks and uh, keeps getting shut, shut down at every turn. But I think he, it's because he feels so passionately that, that uh, it's so painful for him when, whenever, you know, whenever they cut his segments, you know, in half. From if he has his own journey and his his own things that he is suffering all in the midst while the whole place is blowing up and they're going through their the aftermath of the Mitch saga. Right. From the outside looking in, when you look at all of the other characters in the show, who's who frightened you the most and who impresses you the most? The the characters, not the actors themselves but the characters the people the characters well i love that my nemesis the, this season um is my boss you know in stella bach and uh she at, at once impresses me and scares me because uh you know the it's a role that you know she's 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 young she's new at this uh but she injects sort of her a lot of her sort of personal opinions and has and has placed people in boxes to a certain extent which is something that i think you know we're all accustomed to doing you know more now more so than ever and she has pinned yanko in this box uh politically and and it has you know as, as soon as she finds out he makes some sort of offhanded comment about uh about the impeachment of trump she's pegged him one certain way and and uh and and yanko feels he never recovers uh, from that moment in terms of their dynamic and it really affects them moving forward when uh someone tries to cancel him and stella doesn't have his back on the contrary she all she, she continues to make him grovel you know uh in in his apologies 
so uh, she impresses me with with what she's accomplished and she also scares me uh so yeah that, that would be one for sure that's awesome and lastly for our our friend yanko can he have another chance at love <laughs> oh, man. Please. Please. Yeah, from your mouth to carry Aaron and the writer's ears uh i i hope so you know i i mean my gosh the guys you know when we see him at six months after claire broke up with him in the beginning of season two not much has changed with for him emotionally he's still pining over her so yeah i i i hope i hope uh he gets a little bit of break you know and and catches a break and who knows if it's claire maybe or maybe it's somebody else but i would love i would love for that to happen for yanko he's so sweet compared to everyone else i would too <laughs> compared to everyone else Thank you so much for your time. It's an awesome show, and I appreciate you speaking with me. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds. Better shake your booties for black girl nerds.